Hello Africa, it's Monday, the second day of October 2017 and the countdown for the presidential election both in Liberia and right here in Kenya is getting narrower by the minute. Liberia is just seven days before the rest to succeed. The first ever African female head of state, Ellen Salif Johnson. Uh, while Kenya has just 23 more days to go before that much anticipated presidential rerun. Of course, this is Bottom Line Africa. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim, and of course, we are live here right on KTN News. And tonight, our focus will be on the tourism sector in the continent amid loud protests. I'll be joined by Brand Kenya's CEO, Merul Seka, as well as Travelers uh, Beach Hotel uh, Sales Manager, Sales and Marketing Manager, Mr. Wafula Waswa. But first things first, let's take a look at Africa in 60 seconds. At least one person is killed on day one of countrywide demonstrations by Nasser to push for reforms within the IEBC. <laughs> President Paul Bear deploys the military to Anglophone Cameroon following a weekend of deadly protest by separatists. <laughs> Ethiopia's largest ethnic group show open defiance against the government of a marginalization. We need your truck. We just need to get people over to the hospital, okay? Okay. And tonight, one of the deadliest mass shooting in recent U.S. history, as a lone gunman sprays bullets at concert goers in Las Vegas. Welcome once again and Bottom Line Africa begins right now. On our Twitter poll tonight, we are asking you, do you think the NASA demonstrations against the IEBC will bear fruit? We're asking you on our Twitter poll tonight once again, do you think the NASA demonstrations against the electoral body IEBC will bear fruit? You know the drill, our Twitter handle is at KTN News. You can as well tweet me at Yusuf Ibra. Remember to always use the hashtag Bottom Line Africa. And I'm definitely going to go through some of your feedback within the program. Now, top on our news tonight, and hundreds of Kenya's national super alliance, that is, a NASA party supporters, were dispersed by riot police with tear gas for the better part of the day as they marched in protest, calling for the sack of some of the Electoral Commission officials. They won the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission CEO as Rachiloba, and other commissioners sacked for allegedly rigging the August 8th elections in favor of the ruling Jubilee Party. The protesters in the Lakeside city of Kisumu burned car tires, blocked roads and lit bonfires before the police shot tear gas to disperse them as they planned marching to the Electoral Commission offices. The police said the protesters were not given approval and were informed not to hold the demonstrations due to security concerns. The Nazi supporters, however, vowed to resume protest on Friday. <laughs> The IBC, if they do not de meet the demands, yes. there will be no election of 26th yes. of October. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And we want to show them that we are not happy yes. and they must reform yes. for us to have a free and fair and credible election on the 26th. Of course, those are developments right here in Nairobi, the lakeside city of Kisumu, as well as the coastal city of Mombasa. And that is why tonight we are asking you on a Twitter poll if you think the NASA demonstrations against the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission will bear fruit. Let me just take that again. Do you think 
the NASA demonstrations against the IABC will bear fruit. Of course, NASA vowed to conduct demonstrations both on Monday and Friday. Our Twitter handle is at KTN News once again. You can as well tweet me at Yusuf Vibra. Remember to use the hashtag Bottom Line Africa. Meanwhile, foreign envoys in Kenya have criticized both the government and the opposition ahead of a rerun of the presidential election later this month. Representatives from 13 countries and the European Union say the poll must be quote unquote better than the last one, free, fair, credible, and peaceful. Their joint statement follows a meeting with members of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission and calls on all parties to respect the body's independence. Uh, U.S. Ambassador to Kenya Robert Godek says the draft election laws, that is the amendment bills by the Jubilee Party, puts IBC at risk of conducting the elections as against what uh, the court had ordered. For both sides to demonstrate leadership, strengthen Kenya's democracy, and build the country's international prestige. Unfortunately, the opposite appears to be happening. The draft election laws amendment bill, for example, puts at risk the IEBC's ability to conduct a better election within the mandated 60-day timeline and unnecessarily increases political tensions. Kenyans can debate whether or not electoral changes are warranted, but the timing is a serious problem. Wise reforms to an established electoral process take time. They require thoughtful reflection and broad agreement from all parties. Well-established international best practice is to avoid changes to electoral rules just prior to an election. And speaking for the United Kingdom, we're also hoping for a respectful and peaceful poll. We're watching carefully. Anyone who is found to be inciting or engaging in violence must be held accountable, and that should be done by Kenyan institutions. But we are following too, and the UK reserves the right to take appropriate action, which may include refusing and revoking visas. Of course, those were the two major stories that we have been following for you in Kenya. Let's now cross over to Cameroon, where police patrolled empty streets in Cameroon's restive Anglophone belt as a separatist group made a symbolic proclamation of independence on Sunday. The country's main opposition leader says at least 30 people died in clashes with security forces. In Buea, the main city in the English-speaking southwest, the streets were mostly deserted as security forces patrolled the streets, including the area where the separatists were expected to gather. A young man was shot dead by security forces on Saturday in the nearby town of Kumba, known as a rebellious city since the start of protest by the Anglophone minority last November, sparking clashes between security forces and the local population. <laughs> stranger in our own country because like now people are going elsewhere oh, they gave birth to me here in Boya so I cannot go I don't know where to go that's why I'm here mm -hmm. all the people that they are not in that they know where they can go they have already left so we that they, they gave birth to us here we don't know where we can go the population is taken hostage between secessionists and the president who is the only one who can unlock the situation but sadly, the president has once again fell into silence and condescension that cannot be justified today. We are asking for restraint from the security forces in order. We also ask those of the English-speaking activists who are in for separation. There's a methodology, that is, if it's really what they are asking for. There's a methodology that does not include violence, which does not include confrontation with the police. What they're doing right now is endangering the lives of people for whom they say they're fighting. Everything is paralyzed. All is paralyzed. Paying for electricity is difficult. Even to feed the family, to take care of them is not easy. It is difficult. Now, an Ethiopian religious festival transformed on Sunday into a rare moment of open defiance to the government one year after stampede started by police killed dozens 
at the gathering. The Ireche Festival is held annually by the Oromos, Ethiopia's largest ethnic group, which in late 2015 began months of anti-government protest over claims of marginalization and unfair land seizures. Parliament declared a nationwide state of emergency aimed at quelling the unrest shortly after the bloodshed at last October's Irecha. But the protest at this year's gathering has showed that dissatisfaction still runs deep. The Oromo protests were triggered by a government plan to expand Addis Ababa's boundaries, which community leaders denounced as an attempt to steal their land which surrounds the capital. I have come here to celebrate the Eresha festival because it is our culture and tradition we inherited from our fathers. We have been celebrating it for years. Many Oromo political leaders are in jail. People like Dr. Merar Gudina, Bekele Gebra, Dejene Tafa, and so many of our scholars and university graduates are incarcerated in prison. So that's what the people are chanting right now. Last year, many people died in this place because of the stampede. There was a ditch at where I am standing now. But this year, it has been fenced, and the people have continued protesting and chanting for freedom. From Ethiopia, let's now cross over to the west of the continent where Nigeria, Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari, has kick-started the activities to mark the 57th anniversary of Nigeria's independence with a nationwide broadcast. In his address, the president spoke about calls for restructuring agitations in the country, the progress his administration has made in the areas of security, economy, and in moving the country forward and the challenges facing the nation. President Buhari later celebrated the 57th independence anniversary of Nigeria with armed forces in Maiduguri. Some opposition lawmakers criticized Buhari's speech, accusing him of lying about his agricultural policies. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Mr. President has Indeed appreciative of your direction, inspiration, and support to ensure that the armed forces of Nigeria remain paused to confront evolving internal and external threats in order to guarantee the sovereignty of our country and the safety and security of our people. Under this leadership, there will be resources available as much as the country can afford it to support your operations. I would like to remind you that uh, I have mentioned it in my speech today that uh, no matter what happens, the military will remain in the front line until we make sure that people are free wherever they live in this country. Oh, and still in Nigeria, over half of schools in the northeast Nigerian state of Bono are closed with millions of children unable to start school this year due to the ongoing uh, threat of Boko Haram. The United Nations Children's Agency has said, UNICEF said almost 1,400 schools have been destroyed in Bono during the Islamist group's eight year insurgency and 57% of schools are unable to open because of damage or being in areas that remain unsafe. Now, an estimated 3 million children are now in need of education, with many also victims of sexual assault, forced into marriage and up to 100 uh, used as human bombs uh, so far this year. Three years ago, the abduction of more than 200 schoolgirls by the jihadist group in Chibok in northeast Nigeria. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Here in Borno State, over half the schools have been destroyed in the conflict. Thousands of teachers have been killed. So we've got to help the children get back learning, get back to school. And that's as important as the life-saving work we're doing on health 
and malnutrition. Now, further away from the continent and over to a story that has shocked so many people in the world. At least 58 people died and more than 500 more hurt when a 64-year-old gunman with an arsenal of at least 10 rifles fired on a Vegas country music festival, raining down bullets from a 30-second floor window for minutes before killing himself. Now, the death toll, which police emphasized was preliminary, will make the massacre the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history, eclipsing last year's massacre of 49 people at an Orlando nightclub. Some 22,000 people were in the crowd when a man police identified as Steven Paddock opened fire, sparking a panic in which some people trampled on others as law enforcement officers crumbled to look at the gunman. U.S. President Donald Trump has called it an act of pure evil. Thank you. My fellow Americans, we are joined together today in sadness, shock, and grief. Last night, a gunman opened fire on a large crowd at a country music concert in Las Vegas, Nevada. He brutally murdered more than 50 people and wounded hundreds more. It was an act of pure evil. The FBI and the Department of Homeland Security are working closely with local authorities to assist with the investigation, and they will provide updates as to the investigation and how it develops. To the wounded who are now recovering in hospitals, we are praying for your full and speedy recovery and pledge to you our support from this day forward. In memory of the fallen, I have directed that our great flag be flown at half-staff. A very shocking development there in the U.S. Now, our features editor, Asha Muilu, is currently on assignment in Washington and centers this report from there. It's 9 a.m. in Washington, D.C., and I'm currently standing right outside the White House. As you can see, there's the White House right there. But it's such a horrible day for the U.S. There's been a deadly shooting in Las Vegas. It's termed the deadliest shooting in the U.S. history. I mean, 50 people dead, and the number could be rising by one single gunman who was in a top floor at one of the hotels um, at the Las Vegas Strip. And he just simply, you know, he had a bird's eye view and he simply just shot down at concert goers. And there was an open country concert um, happening right uh, below from the hotel and he just shot them. Uh, more than 50 people dead, 150 wounded. It's such a terrible day. We're hearing that um, American press are reporting that uh, Trump right now is with his, his advisors at the White House trying to figure out uh, what to do next. Uh, investigations have been launched, but they don't know the motive of this man. All they know is that he's um, 64 years old. He was a lone wolf. He was he was acting alone. He had a few weapons in his in his hotel room, and he just went to his window, broke his window, and fired down several times, killing more than 50 people down there. So it's really, really terrible. Uh, we're heading out for some interviews here, but we'll be giving you some updates whenever we can. Of course, we'll be waiting for more updates from Asha Mulu. They're reporting from the U.S. as much as you know, the family members of those who lost their lives still are trying to come to terms with that incident. Now, back to the continent and former football star and presidential hopeful George Ware has called for change in Liberia and said he was confident ahead of next year, next month's election in the West African nation. Now, the first African player to win both FIFA World Player of the Year and the Ballon d'Or, uh, Ware unsuccessfully ran as a presidential candidate in the year 2005 when he was defeated by Alan Johnson Salif. He also ran as a vice presidential candidate in 2011, but his running mate lost to Salif, where idolized in his country as quote-unquote Mr. George, has been a senator for the party coalition for democratic change since the end of 2014. Where also offended of criticism for picking as his vice presidential met Gerald Howard Taylor, 54, who is 54 years, the ex wife of Gerald, former president and warlord Charles Taylor. <laughs> I will join the party because of you. 
170 years old. Vlabira is not developed. It's not because of George Weir. Simply because those that you liked her before, they don't care about you. Now you have a son that believes in this country, that believes in you. My quest for leadership is to make you a leader tomorrow. If you want your children's future to be secure, we must put the future of our children in the hands of a man that knows about team playing, a team player. Of course, be sure to get all the latest on Liberia's election right here on Bottom Line Africa. Now, Zambian police on Friday clashed with about 100 anti-corruption protesters outside parliament, prompting arrest on the same day as the finance minister presented the national budget, carrying placards uh, that read, quote-unquote, wake up Zambia. It is our money. They picketed parliament over alleged graft by President Edgar Lungu's government. The demonstration targeted the purchase of 42 firefighting trucks costing one million dollars each a deal that has filled criticism of government spending some of the activists were later detained and taken away in a police van as that police officers surrounded the entrance to parliament buildings <laughs> There's no way you can protect the people that are supposed to be in charge of protecting the country. We are the victims, they were supposed to be protected. Mm -hmm. So if, they, if, if, if we can go by what they are doing, they are helping destroying this country. Yeah. Yes, so the police officers are also accomplices in destroying this country. This is not a political move. This is, the this is our, our demand is that the, uh, that process should be opened up to scrutiny and to a forensic audit. I uh, would like to know exactly how that decision was made and, and all the processes that arrived at it, because we believe that, first of all, it was a very bad budget choice, but also would like to know that it was clean and that Zambia got the best value for money for that $42 million. Over to Libya now, where Benghazi's commercial port officially reopened on after a three-year closure due to fighting between rival factions in the East uh, Libyan city. To mark the opening, Abdullah Al-Thini, prime minister of a government based in the East, arrived on board a tanker sent from the eastern city of Tobruk. The port does not export oil, but imports gas and some petroleum products, as well as general cargo. And local cost uh, for this will be reduced by the port's reopening. Like Benghazi's airport, the port uh, has had been closed since 2014 because of a conflict between forces loyal to Eastern-based commander uh, Khalifa Haftar and an alliance of Islamist and other opponents. Haftar declared victory in early July through isolated skirmishes. Uh, continued Benghazi airport reopened in mid-July. <laughs> Let's now take a look at Events Africa. Well, and before we take a short break right here on Bottom Line Africa, remember our discussion tonight has everything to do with the tourism in the continent. We're not just focusing on Kenya, but across uh, the continent as well. I have two individuals in studio. Of course, one of them is in studio. That is Mary Luseka, the CEO of Brand Kenya, as well as Wafula Waswa, who's the sales and marketing manager of Travelers Beach Hotel. He's, he's going to come to us uh, all the way from the coastal city of Mombasa. It's not a discussion that you definitely want to miss right here on Bottom Line. Line Africa. We're going to take a very short break, but we'll be right back. Don't go too far. <laughs> 